Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about reinforcement. What is it? Why do we use it? And how do we use it? So reinforcement is technically providing something after a behavior occurs that increases the chances that behavior will occur again in the future. We all find different things reinforcing at different times. So in the morning, I really want my cup of coffee and I find it very reinforcing. But in the afternoon, not so much. Other people might not like coffee at all and never find it reinforcing. In addition, we should do frequent preference assessments, which I will cover more later, to guard against satiation. That means you've had enough of something. After three cups of coffee, I'm done with coffee and I want something else. And it also increases the effectiveness of that reinforcement. Reinforcement is not bribery. Bribery is when you provide someone with something before they do something immoral or unethical. Reinforcement is when you provide someone with something after they do something that is socially acceptable, something we want them to do. Why do we need to reinforce? First, remember Thomas Gilbert's behavior engineering model. If you haven't watched that video of mine, you may want to take a look at that. A quick review, in order for any behavior to occur, the person has to know what they're supposed to do, they have to have the skills to do it, and they have to want to do it. We need to realize that not everybody wants to do the things that we would like them to do. Therefore, we need to reinforce them. We need to give them a reason to do it. It also provides a clear signal. People don't always understand what it is that we're asking them to do, particularly if it's a child, and even more so if it's a child with a disability. Imagine someone puts you in the room and they hand you several darts and they tell you to hit the schlork. There are several items in the room, but you have no idea what a schlork is. You randomly throw a dart and it hits a blue item. The person turns to you and says, good job hitting the schlork and hands you a Cheeto, which you happen to really like. You are much more likely to look at that blue item and hit it again, even if it's moved somewhere else in the room. Now imagine if you can't understand language or can't hear that language. So you're in the room, they give you the darts, and you randomly hit something. Maybe the language sounds like wah, 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 but they hand you a cheeto. That reinforcement is that clear signal that you have done what they want you to do. Now, how to do it. I let you know I was going to talk about preference assessments more. This is where I'm going to do it. A preference assessment is when we determine what does this person like? What do they prefer? Sometimes we figure out what people like by asking caregivers, teachers, parents. That's fine, but we're not going to get as good information as if we do an actual preference assessment. There's multiple different kinds of preference assessments that can be done. And I will go over how to do those particular preference assessments later because you may need to be more specific in understanding what this child really finds reinforcing. But a multi stimulus preference assessment with replacement is a good assessment that can be done frequently, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Doing those assessments. Frequently is important because not only do our preferences change from day to day, from week to week, but they can change from hour to hour. When you're going to create a preference assessment menu, you need to understand whom you're working with. Some individuals are only going to understand that concrete the actual item. You may need to have a clear container that has the item in it so they know that that's what they're going to get, that that's what they're going to reach for. Most individuals are going to understand a photograph, okay? That's our first step towards symbolic. Sometimes people are going to understand a line drawing 
or even words either written or spoken it's best to be closer to concrete so that you know that you are closer to making sure they understand what they're requesting so uh, even if somebody's able to read we always understand that if someone becomes frustrated their abilities are going to decrease and so even if they're typically able to read they may not be able to read in that moment of frustration so i typically go for much more concrete either a photograph or the actual item this is an example of a multi-stimulus preference assessment with replacement meaning that every time i ask what do you want i'm going to all of those options are going to be available even if they choose chocolate chips this time chocolate chips is not going to disappear and then they have to choose something else that would be a preference assessment without replacement this is going to be with replacement all of these items are going to be available now make sure they really are available if you're out of chocolate chips don't have it on your menu but having this available to be able to hold out to the person and ask what are you working for what do you want and having it be pictures that are laminated which you can do with packing tape by the way and velcroed on this board therefore you can actually take that picture they can take the picture off of it and hand it to you that's a representative of communication taking a picture and handing it to you is like making a sign that communicates or speaking a word that communicates and then that item can actually be put on the token board or the first then board that can help keep the student the person focused okay if they have five things they need to do and you've got five check marks there and you're saying i'm working for goldfish they've got two of them done you can say oh look three more then goldfish okay it can help keep them focused and motivated during the task. So token boards, which I mentioned a minute ago, help stretch the reinforcer. Again, you need to know your individual. How often do they need to be reinforced to stay focused? Do they need to be reinforced after every single response? In which case I suggest you choose a really small reinforcer. Uh, chocolate sprinkles work well you can give somebody 50 chocolate sprinkles and they've still only had a tablespoon full of chocolate sprinkles you're going to guard against satiation at that point maybe they can wait until after each activity before they get reinforced some students can wait until after each session when you're done with all three of these items then you can have your lego set some students can wait to the end of the day if you earn 80% of your points for today, you will earn a reinforcement. Other students can wait even longer. They can save up for larger reinforcers. We want to stretch kiddos. Oftentimes, young kiddos, uh, individuals that we're first starting to work with, are going to need reinforcement frequently. One of the ways we can stretch that is through a token board. A token board can help increase the time between accessing that actual tangible reinforcer but still providing reinforcement right when you're handing them that token you're still pairing it with the specific praise whether that's able to be verbal gestural sign language you're giving them that token giving them that clear signal you're doing what i want you to do but they're not able to actually access that reinforcer whether that be goldfish or a spinny toy until they have completed it five times, right? So you've got your token board, you let them know you're working for goldfish, but now instead of getting one goldfish after every correct response, they're going to have five correct responses before they have a goldfish. I typically use pennies for my reinforcer money because that is a token that we as a culture have agreed can be exchanged for multiple different things right so i consider it a life skill to understand that money can be exchanged for other items and i typically use pennies some people may prefer to use a picture of a preferred character as tokens because then the individual may 
find it very reinforcing to get a picture of Bluey they can put on their board or a token from a game that they play. Again, it is individualized on the person that you're working with in order to be reinforcing. Now, timing, right? This is another part of the how. For some reinforcers, like an edible, you don't have to worry about timing. They earn a chocolate chip, you give them a chocolate chip, the chocolate chip is gone, they have to do more to get another chocolate chip, right? For other items, such as a spinny toy or a fidget, something like that, you're going to want to put a time limit on that. Okay, you've earned your spinny toy for two minutes. Have a timer that they can see. There's visual timers available, such as a time timer, where they can watch the color disappear. There's also several apps on your phone that are visual timers, so they can see that the time is disappearing, and you can have either an auditory or a visual cue that lets them know time is up. That way it's not you taking it away. The timer has indicated time is up, and then they need to earn more. With other items, such as Legos, they may need a longer amount of time in order to feel like they've had the time they need with those Legos. It could be really frustrating for a student who really likes to build spaceships out of Legos. If they only get two minutes with the Legos and they're only able to put 10 pieces in before it's taken away from them. In that case, I wouldn't suggest that you allow Legos to be a reinforcer unless they're able to wait until they're done with that session and then they can access Legos for the five or ten minutes that they need in order to feel satisfied with that reinforcer. So in conclusion, reinforcement is absolutely necessary, particularly when you expect someone to do something they don't want to do and they find it difficult. Remember Thomas Gilbert and the behavior engineering model. And the strength of that reinforcer is dependent on how difficult or how aversive that behavior is to the person. And that's subjective. It is not our job to tell somebody, oh, that's easy. You can do it. We have no idea how difficult that is for them or how aversive it is. So they get to determine how difficult it is for them to do that and what kind of reinforcement it's going to take. And we need to respect that. What we find reinforcing is very individualized and even changes within the individual as time goes, okay? Frequent preference assessment using that visual menu multi-stimulus with, with replacement is a good way to do that frequently. And also pair that specific social praise with the tangible reinforcer, whether that's saying, good job, giving red, right? Or if that's signing it, or if it's tapping a picture, showing them that they're doing what's right, okay? That way we can eventually fade the tangible reinforcer and have the behavior supported by the natural environment. We don't want kids to be dependent on having a reinforcer for everything they do during the day. That's not our goal here. Our goal here is to teach them the skills they need to complete the task and fade that reinforcement until that behavior is supported by the natural environment. Of course, as always, let me know if you have any questions or if I can make anything more clear. I also welcome challenges. I know I have more to learn and there could be those of you who can teach me on this subject. So please do let me know. Thank you.